Psalm 26. We'll be looking at all 12 verses of the 26th Psalm this morning, especially verse number 7. Uh, but just kind of uh, looking over some things this morning, I guess uh, it's uh, probably a little bit less preachy and a lot more kind of, I don't want to say reminiscing is not really the right uh, the right word, but more of a just considering and kind of contemplatively uh, looking at what the word has for us this morning. And so I hope that as you make preparations for uh, Thanksgiving Day, that we'll all be mindful to remember that in the midst of all of the uh, of the comings and goings and the getting together with family, if you're doing that or if you're traveling, uh, don't forget the Lord. Don't forget to stop. And the reason that we're stopping is to thank God for His goodness to us. And um, we'll be speaking about that here as we get started. Psalm 26, beginning in verse 1. Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord, therefore I shall not slide. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. For thy loving kindness is before mine eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. I have not sat with vain persons, neither will I go in with dissemblers. I have hated the congregation of evildoers, and will not sit with the wicked. I will wash my hands in innocency, so will I compass thine altar, O Lord. That I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving, and tell of all thy wondrous works. Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house, and the place where thine honor dwelleth. Gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men, in whose hands is mischief, and their right, in their right hand is full of bribes. But as for me, I will walk in mine integrity. Redeem me, and be merciful unto me. My foot standeth in an even place. In the congregations will I bless the Lord. Verse 7 again, that I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all thy wondrous works. So we look this morning, I want to speak for just a little while on things for which I'm thankful. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for, Lord, the, the blessing of coming together. And Lord, whether uh, it's a time when things are, are easy or hard, uh, whether your presence is felt amongst us in our personal lives or whether you seem distant, we know that you promised to be there with us. And may we be ever thankful. Uh, Lord, it's so easy. Uh, to get our focus on the things that are hard and that are wrong, uh, that it's, it's easy to lose sight of the goodness and the greatness of God in our lives. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to focus on you, to be reminded of some things this morning that will help us to be a people that honor and glorify our Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. As you look here at this particular text and passage, what David is going through here is the bringing back of the Ark of the Covenant into the tabernacle. And so it's been gone since the Philistines have captured it. Uh, and he has gone at one point and tried to bring it back the wrong way and resulted in the death of Uzzah. Uh, and then uh, three months later, as Obed-Edom's house is blessed, he goes back and this time he brings it back again. Not without cost. His wife uh, despises him for the way that he celebrates and he worships and dances around the ark whenever it comes back into the city. Uh, and uh, she feels that he's acting beneath the dignity of his office as king. Uh, but he doesn't care. He's just worshiping and praising and serving his God uh, and is content and committed to do that. And so that's kind of the background of what's taking place here uh, in this psalm. It's a time of rejoicing. It's a time of, uh, of uh, celebration as God has uh, his presence has come back amongst the people. Uh, when we look at the Thanksgiving Day in our nation uh, and we celebrate that this week, it is a day uh, that has been of great significance really since even before our founding. Uh, I was thinking this week about Thanksgiving and read some things that reminded me of, uh, actually it's a, a, an article that Senator Tom Cotton of Arkansas wrote this week uh, talking about the, our, our heritage and talking about Thanksgiving. And you have to realize today, uh, there's a thing out there called the 1619 Project, which is uh, trying to change history. And a lot of it's being taught in colleges and schools now, uh, or they're trying to push it on the colleges and schools. And you stop and you think about, you watch uh, the celebrations over this past week at how few schools, even at an elementary level, are even mentioning the pilgrims and Thanksgiving and uh, things of that nature. It's being downplayed and minimized because they, the 1619 Project teaches kids to hate their country. 
uh, instead of being people that came and they're thankful and worshiping God in 1620 and 1621, uh, then, uh, then they want us to believe that we were founded by slave owners just simply to be a place of slavery and that the true, the true founders, the slave owners, came in 1619 and therefore we are a nation that's corrupt and immoral and uh, to be loathed and despised. It kind of furthers the narrative of a lot of the of the liberal left. And uh, you can Google the 1619 Project and all kinds of information will come up on it. So uh, what I'm getting at is that there was an article this week that Senator Cotton wrote about the pilgrims, about the founding, about the Mayflower arriving. And you stop and you think about what I just said. How many of us have heard any recollect or any mention of the anniversary of the pilgrim landing this year? It's the 400th year. You would think on the 400th year that there would be a lot of celebration, a lot of fanfare. Uh, as in the fall of that year, I believe in November of, of 1620, they landed uh, in what is modern day Boston at Plymouth Rock. And I've, I've been to Plymouth Rock. I've been to the city of Boston. And Plymouth Rock, I used to, when I first saw it, I was expecting it to be this big, massive uh, boulder worthy of uh, such a name and such distinction. And I got there and it was like this little brick thing built around it and you had to stand over and look down into this hole uh, right on the bay in Boston Harbor uh, where it goes, where Cape Cod circles out uh, because people would come for decades and they would just break pieces off of it so that they could have a, a souvenir and have a part of Plymouth Rock. And so, uh, you know, for, for a couple of hundred years probably until it was protected, it just got smaller and smaller. And if you go there today and you look at it, it's got, uh, well, I say today, I haven't been there since I was 18 years old. So, uh, but it's 1620 is etched and stamped on the rock. And so, it's a date of great significance to our nation, and it's a day that we remember this year. Now, I think that there are a lot of uh, similarities in the sense this year that this has not been a normal year by any stretch. And for a lot of people, it's been a very difficult year. I, I remember last year about this time, everybody was so excited about, hey, six, or, or 1620, uh, 2020, you know, it, it's like, uh, it, it's like the embarking on a new journey. It's like getting out of the teens and starting off and there was a lot of excitement and there was a lot of as the new year came in uh, and that lasted for about eight weeks, maybe 10 and then it all came crashing down. And now uh, at this point, everybody's just ready for 2020 to be over uh, and hoping that 2021 won't be more of the same. Uh, and so it just, it's not been a normal year. It's not been for a lot of people an easy year. It's been uh, a difficult year in a lot of ways. And so uh, when you think about Thanksgiving, you tend to think, well, you know, let's be thankful. It's easy to be thankful when things are great. It's when the, when the bank account's full and when everybody's healthy and when, uh, when things are going well uh, and when there's a lot of harmony, uh, then man, that's a wonderful time to, to give thanks and to be thankful. But you know, for the pilgrims, their Thanksgiving, their first Thanksgiving didn't come after a year of prosperity. Their Thanksgiving came a year after incredible hardship. And though this has been a year of hardship in the modern man's eye, compared to what they endured, this has been a pretty easy year. To, to, to put it this way, when they arrived, they weren't supposed to arrive in the fall. Uh, they were forced out early. Religious persecution, they had to leave, they had to flee. They were supposed to be south, much further south than where they landed. N the Massachusetts is not the place that you want to land in November going into a harsh winter without shelter and without supplies. Their supplies uh, were largely contaminated and their, uh, their hard tack and the food that they had was, uh, was stale and getting moldy by the time they made it and the journey across the Atlantic. And when they landed in the, the harsh winter that was about to hit, uh, they couldn't even really understand what they were about to endure. And so when they arrived, they immediately pulled all their resources and built one big structure for all of them to live in and share together until they could begin to build the other buildings and individual homes and they uh, branched out. But they had to have, with winter coming, they had to have at least one place of shelter for everyone. But having everyone with malnutrition and bad food supplies and having everyone uh, in one locale uh, made, uh, made disease rampant. And in that first year, half or more of their numbers died. 
And when they came to the end of that year and when they did have a crop to harvest and fresh food, they did not sit there and, and lament or be angry at God or be bitter at God because their year was hard and many had died. They simply gave thanks. And I, I think that it's only our nature as people to focus more easily on hurts and offenses and wrongs and difficulties and illness and, uh, and uh, shortages and things of that nature. It's easy when things are hard to complain. We complain by nature. I mean, you, you get around uh, anybody, really, the, the odd person, it really is the odd person that is just always has a grateful attitude or spirit because most of us are a lot quicker to complain than we are to uh, heap praise on something or to express gratitude for it. Now, I'm not saying that I think that we're a bunch of ungrateful people. I think most of us try to express gratitude and say uh, thank you and acknowledge those things. But our first instinctive response is almost always to, to complain about something that we don't like. Okay, so uh, I, I complain a lot. I complain a lot internally. I complain uh, probably too much externally, but uh, I complain. I'm always grumbling. Well, for example, uh, Sonia flew to Arizona on Thursday, so Friday morning I got up and uh, I was so lazy on, on Friday morning, I didn't even want to make coffee. So I just got ready and when I came to the church, I went to get some coffee on my way in. And, uh, and so I'm complaining because the 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 line is like all the way out on the feeder road on I-10, backed up practically the traffic light, which isn't that big of a deal because I'm not going to wait in, the, in that long of a drive through anyway. Uh, so I'm, my plan all along is just to go inside, make my order, get my coffee, and come up to the church. And so uh, I had to kind of get around the line and then get into the parking lot. The parking lot was so full, so I'm griping in my this to my it's just me in the truck. So I'm just I'm just griping at myself uh, about the uh, the difficulty of getting in the parking lot. And then it's full, uh, and there's you know cars coming and going. And so I go next door to the next restaurant down, and I park there. So then I walk in, and I don't know about you, I hate the mask. I am not a fan of the mask, and so I'm not saying that I, I wear it, I do it, you know, I try to be uh, cautious and mindful of those things whenever I go into stores and things of that nature, but I don't like it. And, and so my uh, executive officer that I had when I got out of the Marine Corps when I was at Camp David used to always tell us, he'd say, uh, you know, hey Corporal Cripps, you don't have to like it, you just have to do it. Uh, and so that's the way I feel about the mask. I don't have to like it, but I got to do it, right? So uh, when I, if you really want to hear some griping, get inside my head when I parked far away from the store entrance and I get all the way to the door before I realize that I forgot the mask in the truck. <laughs> okay, so then there's some serious complaining going on inside my brain. So I, I go into the coffee. I remembered my mask. Actually, I got about probably 15 or 20 feet from the truck and had to turn around and go get it. So I'm already fussing. Uh, I get to the entryway. I don't put it on until the last minute. I mean, I'm holding out uh, for dear life. Somebody's just about got to open the door for me before I get willing to put it on. Uh, and so I get ready and I put it on and the strap breaks. <laughs> So I'm so upset at this point internally that I'm just really griping and throwing a fit in my brain. And I'm thinking, I'm not walking all the way back across over there to the truck to get another one. I had another one. So I'm determined that I'm going to make this work. And so I go inside and I'm trying to figure out a way to poke a hole. I forgot my pocket knife that day in this stupid mask so I can, I can tie the, the, the thing in it. I said, it's going to look stupid, but if it, it, the mask looks stupid anyway. So it's not really much of a loss. And so I'm taking a key and I'm trying to jab it through there. And I finally get it through without ripping it too much. And then I'm trying to feed the, st the string through there. Uh, and I'm just getting more and more frustrated. And it's like trying to thread, uh, thread a needle. Uh, whenever you don't have the right glasses to see that close. If you're old as I am, you appreciate that. So I got to have bifocals to see, but if it's that close, I got to take my glasses off and just get it like right here. Uh, and so uh, I'm, I'm trying to feed that through there. Well, finally, one of the workers in the store that I was at took pity on me and brought me a new mask. So I said, thank you. I made my order. The point is, is that we just by nature are complainers. It's just human nature. Oh, we complain. And when the guy gave me the mask, I was appreciative. I was grateful. I said, thank you. And I was sincere. I meant it. But my nature is to notice everything that's wrong and to fuss about it, even if it's only in my mind. And I think that most of us, if we're honest, would have to say that that, that tends to be the case. Our, our natural instinct is to complain, even if we have enough 
uh, enough awareness, uh, self-awareness and spiritual awareness to realize, hey, this isn't the attitude that I should have, and so let me check myself and let me put this in order. Uh, and and to, to move forward in a way that pleases the Lord. And so when we look at the, this year and we look at the things that we've endured, yeah, it's, it's been difficult, but our difficulties compared to the, the pilgrims was nothing. I remember, I was reminded of the words of President Abraham Lincoln in 1863 on Thanksgiving Day. It was a remarkable day because it was the year that the Union had finally won a battle. For three years, they had lost every battle until Gettysburg, or virtually every battle. And Gettysburg claimed the lives of 60,000 men. And on Thanksgiving Day of 1863, President Abraham Lincoln was walking across the fields of Gettysburg, and as he walked amongst the graves of the soldiers, his heart was struck and captivated. And he was not a man who at this point had not already known great hardship. He gave his heart to Christ on that cemetery, on that battlefield that day. To put it in his words that he confessed, he said, when I left Springfield, I asked people to pray for me. I was not a Christian. When I buried my son, the severest trial of my life, I was not a Christian. But when I went to Gettysburg and I saw the graves of thousands of our soldiers, I then and there consecrated my life to Christ. William Jennings Bryan wrote, that on the 4th of July, we celebrate our independence. But at Thanksgiving, we acknowledge our dependence. On the 4th of July, we boast of what we have done. And on Thanksgiving, we feel grateful for what we have received. As we go into this Thanksgiving time, I think that it's important that we, in the midst of everything, just put some things in perspective within our lives. And Though there are a lot of things that we wish were different, that God has still been so very good to us. Amen. That we still can focus so much on what God has given and how God has worked in our life. Listen, through all phases of life, the Christian is comforted to know that God is there. Whether it's hard or whether it's easy, whether it's severe or whether it's, uh, whether it's enjoyable, God is there. Be thankful for salvation. Be thankful for our nation. Not every people across the world can meet freely and openly uh, to worship God the way that we do. Be thankful for family. Be thankful for the church that God has given us. And so as we look this morning, uh, I'm, I'm going to, don't get scared, but I have five points this morning. Okay, so uh, that's, that's, that usually we're three or four, uh, but we'll not be any long this morning. Uh, but, but I want to just draw some things out of this psalm, a psalm that was written with a thankful heart that God's presence and the symbol of his presence and power on Israel was brought back to its rightful place as David rejoiced though he acknowledged some hardship in life uh, he is rejoicing at the presence of God uh, in the nation of Israel again the word thanksgiving in this passage in particular means to acclaim uh, or to vocalize but it doesn't just mean as an individual it literally the word here in Hebrew means as a choir of singers so it is to, as a choir, burst forth into song and praise and reverence and worship of God. And it also means to do so with an extended hand. God, we worship you. We praise you. To sing praise, glory, and honor to God with an extended hand. That's what the word here means when it says that I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving. And so as we think about some things this morning, I'm just going to in some cases reminisce, in some cases just make some observations uh, about some things that I think that it's good for us to, as Christians to just be reminded of, to be thankful for, even though uh, it's been a more difficult year than normal. Notice in verse number one, he says, Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord. What's he saying? I put my trust in God. And when we put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and he gave us eternal life, he gave us heaven. And so I would say this morning, first of all, that the Christian ought to be thankful for heaven. Be grateful that this world is not our home. And I know it's a song and we sing it and sometimes it just uh, becomes kind of cliche-ish. But the reality is, is that we are simply 
sojourning our way through this earth. This is not our home. I'm glad this morning that I have dual citizenship. I'm glad that I'm a, I'm a citizen of the United States of America, but I'm even more grateful that I'm a citizen of heaven. And so when we come together this morning, we think about this, be grateful for heaven. And say, when in heaven is, is, you know, we all think of it as a wonderful place. Uh, none of us have been there. Uh, and so uh, some of us are probably going to expect to wake up there and not. Uh, some of us are probably expect to not wake up there and wake up there. And so uh, depending on, uh, you know, your perspective and understanding of, of, of scripture and then how we live. But the reality is, is heaven. What a wonderful thing. What's so wonderful about it? Well, the first thing that I would point out this morning is that makes heaven wonderful is the presence of God. And I'm, I'm not this morning going to give you a, a, a lot of support scripture like we do most of the time. I think that most of these things we're aware of or you can easily look up multiple verses that are going to draw these conclusions. But the most significant thing about heaven is God's presence. But you know, it's a wonderful thing that we have God's presence right here and now. And so we, it, clearly it's not this, it, it's going to be different in heaven. In, in heaven, all of our pain will be alleviated. All of our, uh, of our, of our troubles and all of our heartaches and all of those things uh, will be wiped away. But the thing that makes heaven significant and special is not that it's not on this earth. And it's not even that it's free from sin. It's the presence of God. God's there. I often think about arrival. What's it going to be like whenever we leave this? And the Bible tells us that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. When we leave this life and when we leave this physical building, tabernacle, uh, then when we come into the presence of our Savior, what's it going to be like? And, and, you know, I can't, I have a lot of different kind of theories and ideas about, uh, about that. I think that there are going to be a lot of people that, that men thought were insignificant on this earth that are going to be received with great fanfare whenever they enter heaven. Uh, but the, the, the greatest thing that's in my mind is that I'm going to come into the presence of my Savior, that the one who gave himself for me, the one who indwells me, is going to be there to greet me. It's a wonderful thing when you haven't been around your family in a while, when you come together on holidays or special occasions, especially if they live far away. That initial meeting, that initial coming into one another's presence, it's just something special about it. There's just something sacred about it. And I think the great thing about the idea that we have that God saved our soul is that we will forever be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. The second thing that I would say about heaven is that we should be thankful for the absence of evil. You know, I don't think that we really fully appreciate the, the infiltration of evil into everything. We, we tend to think of evil as ugly, harsh. We tend to think of evil as spooky or, you know, something that we can kind of tangibly touch and see. But the reality is, is that Satan is evil. Satan is the essence of evil. He is the embodiment of evil. Yet the Bible says that he's beautiful. And there's so much that we are deceived by because of its beauty. Because of its, its, its pleasing aesthetically. And so we embrace it. How could something so beautiful, how could something so accepted? How could something so widely uh, bought into by uh, everyone that I know, even Christians, how could that possibly be wrong or be evil? But I'm just telling you that evil infiltrates everything. I I'm not saying that everything is evil. I'm saying that evil is constantly searching for a way in. It's like water. It's just looking for a way to get in. Just the slightest crack, just the slightest, just to disrupt, just to taint, just to tarnish. Now listen, evil and Satan are in this for the, they're playing the long game. And they're content if they can just get in a little crack right now to wear it away later. It's kind of like 
leftist politics. Things that are never satisfied. It's, it's, just, it's just there. Evil. It, but when we get to heaven, it's going to be completely, absolutely, 100% absent of evil. There's no, there's, no, there's no thought of evil. There's no glimmer of evil. There's no worry of uh, motivations of evil. There's no deception of evil. Evil will be absent in heaven. The third thing that I would say about this is the, the reunion with loved ones. We have loved ones that knew the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Then when we leave this life, when we go into heaven, that's going to be, and we sing the song, it's a great old song, the Glad Reunion Day. What a wonderful thing it is to be reunited with those loved ones. And though uh, we, we don't really understand, I don't think, fully what our relationships with one another are going to be uh, when we get to heaven. Clearly, they're going to be different than they are now. But we'll, we'll know what our relationships were here, but our relationships will be different. The Bible gives us a little bit of information and insight into that, but not a lot. But when we get there, it's just all about being together and being one united in fellowship and in worship of our Savior. And when we come into the presence of God and when we love him and when we experience him and when he uh, works in our heart. That, listen, uh, no matter how bad your week was or your week will be or no matter how bad your health is or how much you hurt or how, uh, how much uh, difficulty lays before it. Listen, heaven is just right around the corner. And, and when you get to heaven, you know, the, 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 all of your ailments will be gone. Brother Chad can throw away his walker. Brother Richard won't need a new liver. Brother Paul will be up running around the auditorium, running laps around the building again. He'll be able to fight back when Miss Debbie tries to take him places that he ought not have to go. Uh, and so, uh, you know, he, uh, he, we, everything will just be set the way that it should be. And praise the Lord for the, the idea that when we come into the presence of God, that everything will, every tear will be wiped away, every heartache will be banished, and the presence of God will permeate everything around us. What a wonderful thing. The second thing that I would say that we see here that we need to be thankful for, we find in verses 3 and 4. For in thy loving kindness is before mine eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. I have not sat with vain persons, neither will I go in with dissimilars, subversants, gripers, complainers. What we are. I'm not even hanging out with myself now. I'm banished from myself, right? Uh, for thy loving kindness is before mine eyes. We need to be grateful or thankful for happy times. Listen, I realize that many of us and many of you this year have had times that are less than happy. But there are a lot of happy times mixed in, and there are a lot of happy times in years gone by. Be thankful for the happy times. Be thankful for the times when, when everything was easier, or when everything was good. And by the way, some of the happiest times are found in the greatest difficulty and, and heartache. And, and enjoy and reminisce. So we're so quick to think about the hardships that we forget the blessings. Be thankful for happy times. Well, what kind of happy times, Pastor? Well, be thankful for special moments. We all have special moments in our life. Be thankful for, uh, you know, the birth of a child or a grandchild. Thankful for a wedding day. Thankful for significant anniversaries and trips. And be thankful for uh, accomplishments and graduations and things of that nature. Be grateful for days when uh, acknowledgement came or when God used you in someone's life to bring them to Christ or to teach them and to help them grow in the grace of the Lord. Special moments. Remember those special moments. Special moments when God spoke to you in a, in a significant way. Special moments when God, uh, when God got a hold of your heart and when God uh, drew you close to him. Uh, I'm just saying this morning that special moments are that. They're special. Remember them and reflect on them and be grateful for them. Hey, if you get up tomorrow and you're really having a tough day, go back and take some time and think about that special time that you had with God or that special moment in life that God gave you and reflect on that. Think on things which are pure and that are good and that are kind and let God uh, win the battle for our minds. Remember special days. You know, there are certain days that are just special. There are certain days that uh, are of, of specific significance. They may not just necessarily be a moment, but it's a specific day. The day that you gave your heart to Christ. 
the day that you follow the Lord in believer's baptism, the day that you won your first soul to Christ, the day that you began your first time of discipleship with a new believer. All of these things, all of these days in our life, they're significant days. Or they're days when God is working, when God is using us, when God is, is doing something special in our life. It's a special day. I would say thirdly here that we remember and be thankful for special memories. There are a lot of memories, there are a lot of things in my life that I just soon forget. <clears throat> and there are a lot of things that I have forgotten. But there are a lot of things that I never want to forget. You know, and with holidays approaching this year, our, we, for, all of our, for all of our children's lives, we program them uh, that when you get grown and you get married and you have your own family, uh, every other year on the same year, you come home, you come to our house for Christmas. The other year you go to the in-laws, you go to wherever, but every other year our house, and the, this year is that year for us. And so uh, there's been a lot of expectation, a lot of excitement, a lot of looking forward to Christmas time this year because uh, everyone's going to be, everyone's going to be together. Everyone's actually able to come. Uh, we realize, uh, you know, there'll be some years when it's not going to be possible for everyone to come, but right now this year everyone's able to come. And so it, it's a special time. Now, that probably has a, a more significance to me at this point than it does them because for all of the not so great memories of my childhood, one of the greatest memories of my childhood was Christmases at my grandparents' house. And but you have to, my, my grandfather died when he was 56. I was about eight or nine years old when he died. And, uh, and, but I, I remember distinctly those Christmases when family would come from far and near. And not just like, just immediate family, uh, extended family. And my grandfather, I'm, I've got, my aunt gave me a couple of boxes of things that were in his desk when he died and some things that he had just a couple weeks ago. And, uh, and it's even got bank statements in it. I'm just telling you, the, the man had a great job, but as far as like he was an engineer, he, I've got drawings that have his signature on them of, of mechanical things that he designed. Uh, but they didn't make a lot of money back in those days. And he didn't grow up easy. He grew up hard. I mean, I remember as a boy listening to him talk about being out in the cotton fields picking cotton. And talking about how many pounds of cotton they had to pick in a day. And, I'm, you know, for my generation on, we don't have any real concept of what that was like. I, I remember driving by a cotton field. I don't ever remember people out in the middle of the field picking it. It's all done by machines by our time. But to that generation, that was what kids did to make money. That's what people did to get by. That's how you survived. And, uh, and for all of the things that they had going on, uh, his house was always the house that if you needed some place to go, if you didn't have a roof over your head, that's where you stayed for a while. And if you were hungry, that's where you went to eat. I don't know how he did it, but and, and my aunt pointed that out. But he fed the world. He fed everybody. And I remember as a kid going there and, and that, that house was not big and we drive by it now and it's, it's, it was really a small house. I don't even know how everybody that was there fit inside the walls of that house. But there were people from f at least three or four states and uh, multiple townships around North Texas and, uh, and everybody was just there and everybody was having a great time. And, I, you know, at least from my perspective as a kid who was, you know, I, naive and ignorant, I was unaware of a lot of the adult issues that were going on. Uh, but everybody was laughing and having a great time. And you can look at the old uh, home movies. And uh, if you ever want to see uh, what Brother Ed looked like whenever he was young, you can look at some of those old home movies. You just can't ever see Miss Rita in there because she was always insistent upon being behind the camera. And so, uh, but they were great times. They were special memories. And so we look forward with great anticipation. And what I'm saying this morning is be thankful for those times. Yeah, we can lament that we didn't have enough years together. Or we can lament that there was disease or that there were, uh, you know, problems or that there were other things that came up and, uh, you know, and, and all of those types of things. Or we can just th be thankful for the special memories that God gave. The times together and the joy. Thankful for happy times. Thirdly, this morning, we need to be thankful for hardship. And again, in... Verses 4 and 5 here, I have not sat with vain persons, neither will I go in with dissemblers. I have hated the congregation of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. Listen, David knew what it was like to endure hardship. He knew what it was like for uh, 
uh, probably three years or more, maybe much longer, to be on the run for Saul, from Saul for his life. To live in a cave, to, to not have a place to call home, to, uh, to have to take safe harbor with an enemy of your nation and to do all the things that he had to endure. He understood even at this point in his life, early in his reign, uh, what, that, that there were hardships that came with living on a sin-cursed earth and, uh, and he learned to be thankful for them. Why so? Three thoughts about why we should be thankful for hardship. Number one, I would say that hardship forces us to be dependent upon God. When things are good, we're too self-reliant. When things are flowing easily, when life has turned into a well-oiled machine, we get too dependent upon the wheels that are in motion that keep it going and not dependent enough upon God. It's easy to become self-reliant. It's easy to look and say, look at what I've done. Look at what I've accomplished. Look at how well uh, things are going. When, when hardship comes, we are forced to depend upon God. Listen, being forced to depend upon God is not a bad thing. Because whether we acknowledge it or not, we are dependent upon Him anyway. But, you know, it's a, it's a great thing when you emerge from hardship and can look back and say, I am now grateful for this difficult thing that God brought in my life because this difficult thing is what brought me back to God. This difficult thing is what brought God's presence back to the forefront of my existence and what is, has developed his love and his, my relationship with him. It is a dependence upon God that is forced upon us when hardship comes. Listen, when hardship comes... People are either going to be angry and bitter at God and flee or they're going to double down and they're going to love God like they've never loved him before. Choose the Lord. Be grateful for hardship because it forces dependence upon God. Not only that, but it should strengthen our resolve. You know, and again, some people, uh, when hardship comes, they just buckle. They're just looking for a reason to uh, quit because the Christian life sometimes is hard. Anyway, I mean, I just I realize that this isn't a newsflash for most of you, but if some of us are thinking that, hey, uh, life was easier before, listen, life is hard no matter what you do or where you are. I can either endure the hardness of life without God or I can endure the hardness of life with God. I, I have chosen that I'd rather have God with me along the journey, even when it's hard, than to go it alone. Be thankful that God is there. Be thankful for in the hardships that not only uh, do I come to a place where, uh, where God uh, is, is my, the one I'm depending on, but it strengthens my resolve. It doesn't weaken our faith or shake our faith. It should make us double down on our faith. The old adage, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. When I was little, I never understood that. Why do the tough run away whenever, the, whenever things get hard? Why are they tough if they're running away? And then the older I got, I finally got to a point when I was a teenager where I started to understand uh, actually what it was saying. That, hey, uh, you know, when it gets hard, that's whenever the tough people just stand up and dig their heels in and get to work. Sometimes in our spiritual life, we just need some, some spiritual toughness. We just need to get going. Things got hard spiritually, get going. Get re-engaged in that relationship with God. Re-strengthen uh, our resolve to serve God and to live for God even whenever things are difficult. The third thing that I see that hardship can do is reassure our values. When hardship comes and when questions have to be answered and when we have to face things, it causes us, if we're not careful, to question our faith. But the reality is, is that what it should do is restore or reassure our values. It should cause us to reestablish. Listen, when I go to the Word of God and when I go to God in prayer, it does not cause me to drift from what God has done in my life, but it causes me to stand firm. He alludes to that in verse 12 when he said, My foot standeth in an even place. And we'll talk about that more in a moment. But be thankful for the hardships in life. Be thankful for the happy times in life. And be thankful for heaven. Fourthly this morning, be thankful for hallowed ground. Hallowed ground is very, very important and special. Notice in verse 8 he says, Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house. And the place where thine honor dwelleth. David has gone and brought the ark back to the tabernacle. He has rejoiced. He has put on a display of worship that has been an embarrassment 
to his wife, but he doesn't care because he just wants to exemplify worship of his God. And he comes here and he says, I have loved the habitation of thy house. I want to be where God is. So, Pastor, God's everywhere. Yeah, but there's some places that are just symbolic of the presence of God. And he wanted to be where the ark was. He wanted to be where God's presence was symbolized and where it was there. And so there, there are two really things about hallowed ground that make it hallowed. I've been to a lot of places that I'm not sure if I went if I went back there now. I'm not sure how much it would still be the, be this way. But I, I remember when the first time I went to our nation's capital, I was 18 years old. I remember the first time I walked up the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, and I remember as an 18 year old being awestruck that the moment people walked in off of the porch and into the room where on either side there's big plaques with different speeches. The Gettysburg Address is one. I forget what the other is. And then the big statue of Abraham Lincoln seated there. Head down because he was assassinated, died in office. And you notice the pictures and portraits of presidents and their head is down. It symbolizes that they died in office. And so his head is down. But when you walked in that room, there was a holy hush. When you stand from the, with the Capitol building and the Washington Monument behind you, looking at the Lincoln Memorial, off to the right is the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. People chatter on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. People are talking freely on their way down the slope, down to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. But when you get to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, off to the right is a statue of three, of the sol three soldiers. And then there's a stand that has a book that has all 58,000 names that are on the wall. So you can look up a specific name by year and it tells you exactly what panel and what row and how to count to find the name that you're looking for. But when you walk past that book, no one's talking. If they are, it's a whisper. You know, it's interesting, Brother Buck, there's, there's no signs that say, be quiet. I remember going to the, right across the river to the Arlington Cemetery going to the tomb of the unknown soldier. And the soldiers there will rebuke those. They have rebuked recently those that are unruly. But back in those days, there was no rebuke necessary. There was silence. I remember when I was in the military and we got our final, basically my final duty station. I served three years up in the mountains in Maryland. And so we lived in our first apartments. We're in a little town called Hagerstown, up, up not far from Camp David. And uh, right outside of the town is Antietam Battlefield. And about an hour and a half up the road and across the Pennsylvania state line is Gettysburg. Walking on the fields of Gettysburg, 60,000 American lives lost. Walking on Antietam, the bloodiest battlefield in American history, over 100,000 died in one battle. And going from monument to monument across that vast battlefield, Everywhere that you stop, everywhere that you go, there's no one running, there's no one hopping, there's no one being boisterous, there's just a solemnity. I remember going to Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C., a few blocks from the White House. The significance of Ford's Theater, if you're unfamiliar with history, is it is the place where President Abraham Lincoln was shot in the back of the head. This, the, the theater is still in, in operation today. And when you walk in, you're struck by off to the, looking at the stage off to the right in one of the boxes, there is, it's sectioned off, has a picture of President Lincoln, and it's draped. And it is the actual booth with the actual furniture that he was seated in when John Wilkes Booth walked into the back of the room and put a gun to the back of his head and pulled the trigger. You can see how far it was of a drop when he jumped off of the, out of the booth onto the stage and ran out the back. When you go across the street to the house that they carried the president to and you make your way up the stairs, all the furniture that was there in the 1860s is still there. When you go up to the stairs and to the right, to the bedroom where Abraham Lincoln was taken and laid on a bed that 
was probably about five or five and a half feet long and he was six foot four. And you look at the sheets that still have his blood stains on them. No one has to tell you that this is sacred ground. I've never had the privilege of going to the Holy Land, but I think that if I ever went to the tomb, that there would be a solemnity there that would exceed by far what I feel as an American. And what I'm saying this morning is that every American, but more importantly, every Christian, should have hallowed ground in their life. Sacred ground. What makes it sacred? Two thoughts about sacred ground. The first thing that makes something hallowed ground is that it's a holy place. It's holy. Now, I understand as an American, there are things that should be holy to us in our founding and our history that's on a different level or different definition even of the word holy in its relation to God. It's more sacred. But holy in the Christendom, God is holy. God's word is holy. God's spirit that indwells us is holy. And that holiness should not be lost upon us. A hallowed ground place is a place that is holy. It is a place that represents the presence and the power of God in our life. It is a place where God worked, a place where God intervened, a place where God spoke to us in a significant way, a place where God worked in my life or changed my life uh, or, or did something specific in me. I, uh, you know, I, I remember listening to uh, my pastor when I first came out working on a church staff. Uh, talking about the church that he trusted Christ in when he was just a uh, four or five year old little boy, and uh, as a, a at that point in time, a man in his forties or late forties and early fifties, uh, I remember frequently when he would preach about salvation, him coming to just this side of the pulpit in the auditorium on the altar and saying, "The building in which I have trusted Christ no longer exists, or it's no longer a church, but this is the place where I gave my heart to the Lord Jesus Christ." If I was in that auditorium. It's right here, this far from the pulpit, on this step. It was holy ground because it's where he met Jesus Christ. I remember drifting away from the Lord while I was in the military and for several years being away from God. I remember still to this day, and I'll drive past this place a couple of times in December. Every time we go to Tennessee, I'm reminded. And I, I don't often say anything about it when we drive past it, but I seldom don't think about when I come over the top from uh, Cleveland, Tennessee, back down into Chattanooga, and God had been dealing with my heart, uh, and there's, there's a pull-off there that overlooks a Sequoia Valley. Uh, and uh, and I remember getting to the point, driving to work one morning, that I could not even drive all the way to work. That God's Spirit just overwhelmed my heart, and I finally gave in, and I had to pull off and just weep like a baby in that side of the road in the middle of, on, a, on Interstate 75. That place is holy to me. That's sacred ground. Familially, family-wise, there there are places there are there are. Uh, maybe a house or a particular grave of a loved one. That's holy ground. It's significant. It's sacred. And as Christians, we should be thankful for those holy ground places. The other thing that makes it hallowed ground is that it's a costly place. The reason that heaven is so sacred the reason that the church is so sacred, the reason that the moving of the Spirit of God in the hearts of Christians is so sacred is because it's so costly. Why, as an American, do I value our history? I love our history. I love it because the cost. What we enjoy, what we experience came at a great cost. But compared to the cost that Jesus paid to redeem our souls, it's nothing. 
What we have as a child of God was, with great, was provided with great cost. What we have and will have in heaven came at great cost. What we enjoy uh, as God's people with his blessing and his provision came at great cost. It is a costly place. Listen, for those that, 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 that you know, have, a, have little value for the church, have little value for coming together as a body of Christ, have uh, little value perhaps for God himself or for God's working in their life, they have lost sight of the price that was paid. Jesus gave himself for the church. came at great cost. And if it was worth so much to him that he was willing to pay so great a price, how could we not hold it in high regard and value? Be thankful for hallowed ground. Be thankful for hardships in life. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Be thankful for happy times. Be thankful for heaven. And finally this morning, be thankful for the honor to serve. It is an honor to serve the Lord. So often we look at it as a duty, we look at it as a drudgery, we look at it as an inconvenience. But truthfully, when, I'm, when my heart is thankful and when I'm focused on what God's done in my life and when, I'm, when I realize how God is powerful and his presence is overwhelming, I should be grateful for the opportunity to serve. Uh, November is Veterans Day every year on the 11th and and, uh, you know, a lot of businesses in this day and age, it's a lot different now than it was in the 70s when people were coming home from Vietnam and soldiers were despised and, uh, and ridiculed and spat upon. After 9-11, after uh, you know, there, there is a, a, an appreciation. I think that's a good thing. I think that it's, it's uh, uh, appropriate. I'm, I'm appreciative of it. I'm always uh, kind of taken back. If I, a lot of times I'll run into a store somewhere and I'll just have something that'll have some little military insignia or something on it. Uh, just an old t-shirt and, and somebody will stop and want to talk and reminisce about, hey, where'd you serve? And I did here. Or they'll thank you for your service or what have you. Those are all good things. And, and I, you know, it's kind of embarrassing on some levels, but then on the other hand, it's a good thing that people are grateful for those that have served our country and provided us freedom. But I want to tell you, I've never felt like it was a burden to serve. And I think all of our veterans would, would say amen to the fact that, that we all feel like to serve was an honor. I, I didn't get drafted. I didn't get sent there by a judge. I didn't have a choice between prison or the military. I chose. It was an honor to serve. But it's a far greater honor to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And as a Christian, if my attitude is always on the negative and the hardship and the disappointment and, uh, and those that turn away from Christ and those that forsake what God has uh, done in their life in the past and what you're trying to help them accomplish and see in their life, those things can be very disheartening, discouraging. But the reality is, is that God is still good and God is still on the throne and God is still working in lives and God is, listen, live for and serve those that have a heart and a desire to know Christ. Invest your time in those that, I'm not saying don't reach out to those that's, that have slipped away, but I'm saying give the majority of your time to somebody that's got a hunger for God, a zeal for righteousness, a desire to learn the truth and to hear the truth and, uh, and to, to live their life for God so that uh, they're growing and they're developing in the Lord. Why, why is it so important, Pastor? Well, two thoughts about this and we'll be done this morning. Number one, serving is an exercise of love. It's an exercise of our love for the Savior. I don't want to be the kind of Christian that's an ungrateful child that just takes and takes and takes and takes and takes and never gives back. I, I, I don't want to be that kind of child to my Heavenly Father. We didn't train our children to be that way and we're glad that they're not and, and we don't want to be that way to God. Don't, don't be guilty of being that kind of a person that whether you're a member at church or whether you're a student in school or whether you're a, a, a child still at home or whether you're a, an adult that still has living uh, parents, don't be guilty of being a person that's just always on the take and I've got time for you as long as you're giving me something. And I don't mean necessarily always something that's physical or tangible. Sometimes it's just advice or love or counsel or support. Or, but you're, you're, as long as I'm getting, I'm here. But don't be that kind of person. 
value what God has given. Value the love that's been given. Serve God, not because, God, I'm going to serve you so that I can get from you, but God, I just simply want to express my love to you. Serving is an expression of love. And the, secondly about that, I would say that it's a fulfillment of my Christian life. Serving is the fulfillment of the Christian's life. There is nothing, it's, while, it, while it is true that there are a few things as devastating as having someone turn their back on years of investment and walking away or going back to the world or forsaking what you've invested in them in. It's, it's, it can be devastating. I'm not trying to minimize that. I'm just saying that on the other side of that coin is that there's nothing that's more fulfilling than seeing someone give their life to Christ to learn and to grow in his grace and to go and serve him. You might have to cycle through 100 or 200 to get one or two that give their full heart and life to God, but it's well worth it. Hopefully, the statistically, it's better than that, but you get the point of what I'm trying to say. I, it's easy to be overwhelmed by those that forsake in a day and an age whenever the Bible told us it would be this way when people are going to be forsaking. It's so much better to just focus on those that have a heart for God. I, I tell you uh, what an encouragement uh, Don is. Amen. What an encouragement a Frankie is or a Chad is or a Chris is. And I could go around the room and I could say different things about everyone that's here this morning about ways that we encourage and ways that we're a blessing. But there are so many uh, that for different reasons. For some, it's because there's a zeal and because they're new and because they're challenged. For others, it's because they're recovered uh, and recovering spiritually and have been down similar roads that I've been down. And for others, it's, uh, it's just a sweet spirit and a heart to serve God and a, uh, and a desire to make a difference in the lives of others. And hey, listen, let's be that kind of Christian that is thankful for the honor to serve our God. It's an honor to serve Jesus. And too many of us find ourselves going through difficulty and feeling that it's just a drudgery or we're going through the motions of the Christian life and we're not experiencing all that God has for us. Listen, just be thankful. I realize that this is a tough year. I know that many of you are going through very difficult circumstances in your life. And for a lot of different reasons. And I'm not trying to minimize that. I'm not trying to say that it shouldn't hurt. I'm not trying to say that it shouldn't uh, be overwhelming at times. I'm just saying this morning that in the midst of it all, Jesus is with you. And I can either be destroyed by the hardness and the hardship and the cruelty of life, or I can be thankful that one day I'll leave this world behind and I'll be with God in heaven. And I can be overwhelmed by miserable times, or I can rejoice and reflect in the happy times. And I can be distraught with hardship or I can focus on God and be grateful for what God's doing in my life in the midst of it. Or I can minimize the value of what generations before have provided to me. Or I can rejoice in the hollow ground that God has given. And I can resent a call to service or I can express the love and gratitude that my heart should have for my Savior in my service. Where are you this morning? See, God's told us to do everything with thanksgiving. In everything, give thanks. Whether it's good or bad, whether it's hard or easy, whether it's crushing emotionally and spiritually or whether it's uplifting, give thanks. Why? Do everything with thanksgiving, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Give thanks in everything, because God's in everything.